Hello. Today I'm going to tell you a story about solidarity and generosity of the human spirit. The story that I'm going to tell you, this particular one started in 2010, in January. It was a regular Tuesday. We were just getting over the holidays. People were, you know, kids were still playing with their toys and we were trying to lose the weight we gained. And on that Tuesday afternoon, as we were heading, most of us were heading back to home from work, an earthquake happened in the island. In our side, in Santo Domingo, it was nothing more than a big scare. However, our neighbors in Haiti fared much, much worse. The city of Port-au-Prince was completely destroyed, and soon we were getting the figures of the devastation. Hundreds of thousands of people had lost their homes. Tens of thousands of people had died. After the disaster, very soon after, the international media descended in the city. News outlets from all over the world were relaying images of the devastation and of the need of that vulnerable population, how they were facing so many struggles to survive this disaster. The news media, after relaying those images, they made the population that was at home, like me, like you guys, probably. Some of you might have been to Haiti. We wanted to do something. We wanted to help. A lot of people decided to donate. Collection centers were set up all over the country, all over the world. Schools became collection centers, churches, offices, malls. Everywhere you went, people were collecting things for Haiti. Things from canned goods, clothing, etc. This process is a familiar one that happens after disasters. It's called material convergence. However, it is not a happy story. The story of generosity and solidarity becomes a tragedy. The influx of large amount of donations into a disaster area are routinely called by disaster responders as a second tier disaster. In 1957, social scientists first documented the issue and since then, a little bit of research has been done, not too much, but we have been able to witness the phenomenon happening over and over again in disaster. I'm part of a research group that routinely visits disaster areas, and we have seen it in the Gulf Coast after Katrina. We saw it in Haiti after the earthquake. We saw it in Japan after the earthquake and tsunami. We saw it in New Jersey after Sandy. Last year, I was able to see it in Houston after the floods brought in by Harvey. Our research shows that over 60% of the supplies that are received after a disaster are non-priority. What does that mean, non-priority? It means they should have been in the disaster area in the first place. It means they have, they are no use to the response and are actually a hindrance to the process. How are they a hindrance? Is it as bad as I say it is? I mean, I see people and they don't believe me. Well, I'm gonna try to tell you the journey of the supplies and I'm gonna try to tell you how they obstruct the response. First, when the disaster happens, all those supplies need to be transported to the area. So they're competing for the same planes, trucks, boats, that other more high priority goods are gonna use to reach that area. The impact then reached the entry points, border crossings, ports, airports, the handful of highways that reach the area. Those highways get congested 
with all the flows that are getting there. So the, the same transportation capacity and infrastructure that is transporting doctors, first responders, medication, and other high priority goods are competing with the sundries of donations that arrive from toys, clothes, etc. Once they reach the entry points and they're able to go inside to the disaster area, it gets, I could say, worse if it's not already. There's usually a couple of ways that they could go. The trucks can go to a local organization. Mostly inexperienced organizations receive all donations that come their way until their storage capacity is filled. Once that happens, they either store it wherever they can or send it along to another organization. Others, they don't know where they're gonna drop off their things. So they drop them off in the street. I've seen both cases. After Harvey, I saw how don donated clothes travel from one church to the next because they were really of no use. There were just a lot of clothes that were not going to be used for, of use to the survivors. In other cases, they're just dumped in the street. And, you know, you don't believe me, but here's the picture. Those clothes were dumped in the streets of Haiti. Those were donated clothes that were just dumped there because nobody would take them. What happens to those clothes? They become vectors for disease. A couple of rains and they're rotting. And that happens over and over again. Another example I have of just how inefficient these supplies can be is this example from Japan. Through a donation campaign, people donated clothing from all over the world to the survivors of the hurricane, of the earthquake. What happened was, in the end, roughly 9,000 items of clothing cost over $80,000 to ship. And I'm not counting how much the clothing cost. I'm, I only have the shipping cost. If we use those shipping costs to purchase the items in Japan, in the local economy, we could have purchased four times as much. So it's definitely not as efficient as it should be, as it could be. And now you're thinking, well, those are clothes. That's not really priority. What about water? What about medicine? Those are definitely things that are needed, perhaps even food. People need food. Well. Even those goods, when they arrive in such quantity that they meet the demand of the surviving population, as soon as they meet that demand, they become non-priority. When we have enough, we don't need more. I'm gonna tell you what happened in Indonesia after the tsunami in 2004. Four tons of drugs arrived in the island for a population of two million people. That gives us about two kilograms, four pounds per people. That surpasses the consumption rate for years. In the end, medications that were about to expire, medications that were not appropriate for the population, cost the government of Indonesia six billion dollars to dispose of. So, the story that I've been telling about generosity, about solidarity, it's a tragic one. In my research, I've been trying to figure out why people donate things and not cash. Because I do believe cash is the best thing that you can donate after a disaster. 
I've interviewed people and I've conducted survey surveys and I've gained some insights as to why people prefer to donate things. One of them is that 40% of donors that have a personal connection to the disaster area feel that donating things makes them more connected. They feel affinity with the population, so they want to do something that takes some effort on their part. Other reasons to donate things sometimes are not so clear or not based in truths. 50% believe that survivors have lost everything, so they need everything. Well, that's partially true. You know, they do need mostly everything. However, sending a dining room set from Atlanta to Texas is not the best way to go to give them what they need. And I know this has been done because I had to unload it while I was in Texas. So I had to unload the dining room set. So, um, you know, the money that the donor spent in renting the truck and getting the dining room set there could have been put to better use for the survivors to buy the things they actually needed in the local markets and started getting their communities back on track. Other reasons, 35% believe that disaster responders will find something useful to do with the donations. That one is simply not true. I mean, could happen, but not really. Disaster responders are pretty busy after a disaster. There's just not that many of them to handle all that's coming their way. Here's a picture in Japan, convention center, after the earthquake. A quarter of the personnel there was handling clothing. Clothing, donations of clothing. And you would think, well, there's a lot of people there. They're probably sorting it by size. They're probably, you know, making it so that people can come and get it. Well, the amount of clothing that was arriving there did not allow for any of that. They were putting it in bags to get it to the trash. So, yeah, everybody's gloomy. This is not like the story you were expecting. Everybody's a little sad right now. I'm, I'm, I'm the better of bad news. I know. It's, it's not all bad news. We can still help. Like I said, we can still donate cash after a disaster. Our cash will help the local economy and will, even if you donate it to a large organization that is not going to use it right away, it's going to probably help to the next disaster to the logistics, to being ready to that next one. But I see some skeptics, yeah, yeah, I see them. You think, I mean, you don't know where, you're, where your money is going to end up. I understand. I mean, even after I told you that the things you send don't reach the survivors, you're still thinking maybe my money is not going to reach the survivors. Well, in this case, us as donors, there's a job that we need to do. And is we need to find that organization that we're gonna trust. I can, ha I can give you an example. Collaborative aid networks, networks that are built for other purposes, such as Servicio Social de Iglesias. They, they have congregations here in Dominican Republic and in Haiti, and they outperformed the relief distribution of the United Nations after the earthquake. Organizations such as this have the networks, have presence in the area, know the victims, know the survivors, they know what is needed, and they have the resources, the trucks, to get them there really quickly. They probably could use some of the resources and the donations that you have. So we have to find those that are doing the good job and try to give our donations to them. Moving forward, we really need to educate the donors and the media. 
We need to let them know what happens to physical donations. That diagram that I showed, all the stages that they go through, we really need to let people become aware that physical donations can become obstacles to the relief efforts. And the media should also be made aware that the imagery that they portray frames the opinion of the people that are, are going to be donating. This all needs to be done in times before a disaster. We also need to raise the profile of the local groups. In, my, in our research, we found that local responders are the most trusted groups by donors. So they are primed. They are the ones that should be conducting the outreach campaigns in their communities and spreading the message that after a disaster, please donate cash, not things. Thank you.